How nice. Got my cue clicker. Got my notes. Good afternoon. Can't see you. That's a problem for me, but I'll pretend. So let me do my own little personal introduction, and then I'll get right down to business. Um, there's a lot to share. And my role is to educate, to inform, so you can make whatever it is that you want to make happen, happen, relative to business. So about me, other than what uh, Brian said, first of all, I am from Mississippi. I'm the oldest of four children. I have done a business where it was bootstrapped with some founders. It ended up being a global business, and it was acquired for more money than I ever dreamed of. Never thought about selling the business, but that happened. I've also been an angel investor as a result of having the exit. I got to be an angel investor. I've enjoyed that. I've invested in probably over 25 uh, businesses, which has been fun. I've also been a venture-backed CEO, which was the hardest job in my life. And I'm a late bloomer, so I didn't do this hardest job in my life until I was 55. And I wouldn't recommend that, frankly. I think I should have taken up golf or tennis or some other fun sport. But uh, it is to say that for my soul's journey, that was required. And it's from those different dimensions of experience that I'm going to talk today about finding money. I guess the last thing you should know about me, though, other than I live in Mount Adams, which is a fantastic, yeah. beautiful place, just as pretty, actually, as Pack Heights in San Francisco, just not as, as many bridges, but they're not just the same bridges, right? But I would say that to know about me is to understand that I operate as a maximalist, meaning I'm not an A to B to B to C to D to C, you know, I'm not that girl. I like to jump track and come back, and I always like to have impact that hits multiple angles at the same time. That does make our regional leaders a little crazy sometimes because they want me to rest in place more than I want to. But at the end of the day, think of me as a maximalist. You'll hear that when I go through this presentation. And then know that business is my art. And in that way, I adore every part of business. Okay, so with that, the reason I was recruited to this beautiful region, this Ohio Valley, is to create a tech-based economy. And you say, ooh, that sounds very pointy-headed. Well, here's how we see it. In a tech-based economy, there is supply and there is demand. And we are unique here in this region of having 191 and growing by the minute, high growth startups. That's amazing. And so we had to get organized around that portfolio of new business creation and connect it to 140 or so very large, we affectionately call them big co's. So the connection between startups and big co's creates an economy as long as there's money flowing. The spirit of the money and the money itself creates the economy. And we are very proud that we can now track the way this economy is flowing, which will create a future for us all and your children and their children and so on and so on. So over the last 90 days, We've been able to create, bring into this region, all of us, not just centrifuges, $45 million that has gone into the bank accounts of startups here in this area. That's really impressive, right? Really impressive. And the flow of that is what's important because money goes in and it doesn't stay there. It goes out in what way? We market our products and services. We hire people. All this is very important for the economy, the flow. In addition to that, we're in charge of the contracts between these big companies and these startups, and we've done over a million dollars, which really is a number that needs to grow and grow and grow, but at least we're getting started, right? A million dollars of pure contracts between these organizations. So if someone asks you, well, I heard this Wendy Lee speak, and she's talking about this economy, like what the heck is that? You are now my ambassadors, our ambassadors. I need you to go forth and help our whole region understand what 
what that means. Startups plus big co's, money around it, success down the road. Does that make sense? Good, glad it does. Now, so with that as um, the big picture, and by the way, that's what gets me up in the morning and takes me down at night, right, is the opportunity to build that for this region. And remember, I don't know anyone here. I just came here, kind of a stranger in this new land, but it feels like home now, and I'm confident that we can bring that home for the region. Now, many of you, and maybe half of you, have heard about this startup Sensi concept. Startup Sensi is not the objective of the work. It is a strategy. Okay? And if you're a maximalist, you're always looking us for a strategy that can create leverage, so what? You can move fast. So Startup Sensi, hashtag Startup Sensi, beautifully designed by folks on my team, Eric Weissman and others. So we just had to have an umbrella to move the beast. Because as it was, we were all in little silos doing what little silos do, arguing amongst themselves talking about the power of their little silo. Well, you know, you're not going to like create an economy that way. It just doesn't happen. So we created this strategy around Startup Sensi, which was actually created initially by Dave Knox, who's the founder of the brandery. And he got busy and no one could use it. So we just like, okay, we'll take it. Is that okay? Cool. We rocked on. Now, there are three specific benefits that are happening, will happen. Remember, I'm a maximalist. Three benefits, not one. Three benefits to building this economy and using startup sensing. One is, by creating this tech economy, we will encourage the modernization of our big codes. You say, what does all that mean? It means that these large companies use technologies that are a bit dated, long in the tooth. They pay too much for them. They're not experimenting enough. And that is sometimes restricting their internal efficiency as well as their external efficiency. Does that make sense? So we need to get our big companies, and we won't name any of them because you probably work for all of them, or most of you do. I mean, just to say with grace, we understand that they could spruce it up a little bit and try some things out that would be creative and drive growth. Okay, number one. Number two, I am very keen to make sure this tech-based economy we're, we're creating, that it also fosters new Main Street. Now, I am fortunate enough to be in a beautiful new building in Over the Rhine called Union Hall. Way before my time, this was funded and been worked on, so I have nothing to do with that. I am just the, get to be in it and enjoy it. But you, if you're in Over the Rhine, you will notice all kinds of very interesting new retail shops. Those retail shops are critical to our economy. And how they operate with technology is non-trivial. They lean into customer experience, not just customer satisfaction. So I want you to know that we are also encouraging all small businesses that are using tech, not just in a POS way, but to even create an experience with their products or service. And then the last thing, which is, by the way, is a primary issue in this region. I hear it everywhere I go, from the Chamber to Ready to City Hall to P&G to Kroger right, yeah, and everything in between, it. every company yeah. in between, every entity in between, is that we want to attract fresh talent. Now, those are words right out of the script of the mayor or someone else. I don't, I'm not sure. They're not creative in my, my book. But I'm like, what does that mean, attract fresh talent? Now, in my world, or the world I was born and raised in, what it means is digital native human beings, folks that want to do what? Stay connected, that are curious, that will search for things they want and share them with others right? That's what I think we need. Digital, inclined, connected people who want to be transparent and share what they know and learn with others. That's what we need in Cincinnati. And maybe all of you are that. If you are, yay you. Okay. So next, here we go. Now, let's get to the, to the essence of this. I said business is my art. I love business, oldest of four. I've been organizing things forever. So let's talk about what an entrepreneur really is. You have seen many on stage, and some of them very, very inspiring, far, far more than I will be. But in my view, an entrepreneur is an individual, a human being, that makes a choice to organize, collect, or build a business 
that results in more than normal risk. And that risk can look like financial risk or emotional risk, right? That's what an entrepreneur does. They're conscious about that. I'm taking a risk. I'm jumping out of the box, right? I'm choosing to do this. And I know there are going to be dark nights of the soul. Let me tell you, I've had many. And then there is financial risk, meaning I could lose everything. Now, I want you to look at me. No, I'm from Mississippi. I have been washed out of cap tables and washed up relative to some other businesses I've been involved with. And in neither case has it killed me. It's only made me stronger. That's what entrepreneurs do. They are fearless in their passion and interest of that which they are building. And I don't care who funded it. I'm going to come down to funders, but it could be your mom. It could be PNC Bank. It could be a fancy pants VC from Sand Hill Road or anybody in between. But that's really not the point. When you're an entrepreneur, you don't think of that first. You just think about, look, I'm in this. I love it. I'm going to make it happen. Now, moving on. There are three things that sit under the category of resource. And Brian, you actually mentioned that word. So resources are what entrepreneurs have to play with, right? Those are your variables. You are successful as an entrepreneur to the degree you manage your resources efficiently and effectively. Please know that. No victims in my world. I don't want to talk to you if you feel sad, you're not sure, someone took that away from you. Not my game. Right? I'm just not into that. What I'm into is abundance of resources, time being the most precious investment capital of all, people critical to success, and then there's money. And so let's just be straight up and highly pragmatic, because I am, I am that girl, if nothing else. you got to have money to make the thing work. Don't, be, don't feel embarrassed about it. You need money, period. Now, how you get the money, where it comes from, I'm going to come into that, but you need money. So I'm going to go from this big picture of resource down to from time to people and now to money. Now, love this strip. This was just coming through the Internet a couple of weeks ago, but it's great. Because if you're going to go raise money, I want you to know that this doesn't work so well. I have a great idea for a startup company. All I need is a seed investor. I need some money, about 25K. That's all. I get asked this all the time. Only 25K. I'm like, wow, not bad. I just met you and you want 25K of my money. Oh, yes. And I have, like, what are you going to do with it? Well, you know, I'm going to hire an engineer and then I'll have an, something. I said, no, you'll have nothing, right? You'll have nothing. The economic value of that is zero. So you have to understand that when you're talking to someone and trying to get money from them for your idea, they're just skeptical. They don't mean to be mean. They're just skeptical because they've heard it a thousand times that they're in the business of investing, right? Yeah, I've got this idea. It's in a PowerPoint, and I'm going to find Sam. I met him a couple of weeks ago, and he's going to do this on the side for me. Yay, and then we're going to, like, all be rich. No, you're not. It's not going to work that way. It never does. I mean, it's a good idea. Now, the kind of business I want to focus on for the rest of this presentation is what we would refer to as a high growth business, a tech-based high growth, which doesn't mean it's just software. It could be a commerce uh, capability, but I want you to think of it as high, gro high growth. So I want you to imagine that there are three dimensions that you have to look at if you're going to build a rocket ship, right? One is you've got to really be clear on the size of the market you're, you're um, pursuing. And I don't mean, don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting you have to go to an analyst and get a report and come up with some silly numbers that don't mean anything to anyone. I'm saying you, as an entrepreneur, need to figure out in your mind how big, how large the real potential and upside of the market is. That will have a lot to do with someone writing you a check other than your mom or your brother, right? It just will. And I'm talking using other people's money now which is a whole different set of expectations. When you use other people's money, there's a different kind of stress that goes through the pipes.
a different kind of stress, right? Now, the other thing that this investor or that you should be thinking about is you're going to take this money because you want to move fast. You do not want to rest in place. No one's going to invest in your idea, generally speaking. That's a little strong, no one. Generally, no one will invest in your idea if, unless you have a sense of urgency for a specific reason because you see that the window of that market is going to close very soon, right? Or if you're trying to move on a particular feature very fast. Every investor I know of, angel or high net high growth VC or even anything in between they want to sense and understand the pace at which you're going to grow your company right they don't want you to lollygag around they want you to get on with it right and they want to know that you value your time which is an important resource and then the third thing they want to know is can you scale it Scaling is not just a jargon word that big companies use. Scaling is a word that investors use. Because once you get to product market fit, they want to throw gas on the fire. What does gas look like? Money, right? So when you take that decision, you've got to be mindful of this. So I'm putting you right now in a situation where you have an idea, right? And you've decided to go use other people's money and when you're coming up with your next step with that potential investor, you know they're thinking about size, speed, and scale. Does that make sense? Right? Good. Okay. Now, I want to go through a few examples. And this is the fun part about being in San Francisco, right? Very fun. So I had, in a five-year period, I had the opportunity to see five friends, not buddies, but colleagues, go from zero to IPO. Zero to IPO. That's non-trivial, right? And let's be specific. This is Zendesk, Mikkel's vein, right? From uh, Denmark. Zero to IPO in a time period that where I was in San Francisco. He had no revenue. He couldn't raise money. And then he goes IPO. What about Lynn Zurich with Sunrun? Just went IPO, by the way, with her child at NASDAQ when she rang the bell. Pretty cool, right? Stanford, zero to IPO. What about Brian Halligan from HubSpot? Zero to IPO. These are real stories, guys. This is something in our region we need to aspire to. You don't have to sell out fast. You might for a specific reason, or you can think about going all the way. I just want to tell you what it's like when you go all the way. Not because I've done it, because I have five close colleagues that have. So I'm going to go through an example very quickly of who knows Box. Does anyone here work for Box? Okay, Aaron Levy. Anyone met Aaron Levy? Okay, so he's still under 30, pretty sure. When I first met him, there were six of them in a small coffee shop. And this is not two decades ago. This was seven years ago, across from Starbucks in Palo Alto. A friend of mine went to work with him as a consultant. He had some very specific, he had a vision, he had passion, and he had courage. And guess what? Never graduated from anything, right? And no, no college degree at the time. And here he has now gone public, and he raised, though, along the way, how much money? About $400 million before he went public. Don't freak out. It's possible. Why could he do that? He had a great idea right? He knew he could scale it and he wanted to move fast and he got to product market fit. It's very possible. But the things that he had to live with every day from coffee shop to now a fancy big office in Redwood City is he had to make sure that he didn't lose the plot, that he continued to communicate his vision, which he did, and tried to take down Microsoft. And by the way, halfway through, interesting story, halfway through his journey, my best friend, one of my best besties, worked for him as VP of Alliances. Right. Halfway through, they got an offer to sell out for $500 million. This is public information. They passed. Yeah, where's your stuff? They passed. Why? Because he had vision, he had courage, he wanted to take it all the way. And some will. That doesn't mean you have to or should you feel guilty if you don't. I just want us in this region to know it's possible. That's all. Instead of like playing small. I don't want us to play small. Now, the specifics of how this looks, 
very simply, is that there are different types of financing along the way. That's all this picture shows. So first you have an idea, then you're around the table, then you get family and friends to throw in 5K or 10K, maybe 25K if you're Aunt Wendy like I am, and lose that money. Or you go to a seed round, okay, cool, there are professional seed investors, I'm one, I never lead, I always come back, I come behind someone that's much smarter than me, more professional than I am about doing due diligence, and then there's series A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's alphabet soup, and that's when you're on the way. And all the junctures in between are very, very important. And then you've got the big IPO, or not. Sometimes you can get acquired before then. This is an important picture. The last part in the next five minutes, and it's a good thing because I have five points, yeah. I'm going to leave you with some very specific ideas uh, around if you're going to go out and use other people's money. These ideas were created by Tim Sugal. They were created by Kevin Mackey. We actually deliver a funding workshop on a regular basis. They do, not me. And I've taken this right them from their deck, so you'll have these points, and you can refer to them even if you want to talk to them directly. Okay, first of all, Please don't come in your mind or to us with a list of your wish. This is my wish list for VCs. That's silly. No, you don't have a wish list. You have a target list, right? That target list needs to be aligned with where your category of, of capability, aligned with where you are in your financi uh, financing cycle, with where you are geographically. That's the truth. And I'm telling you, because I'm a mentor with the Brandery and many other accelerators here and in Boulder, when someone comes with their wish list, I'm like, you know, you haven't done your homework. I don't want to wish. I need a target list, and then I can figure out how I can help. So I don't want to be cranky about it, but that's the truth. Okay, so the next thing is, the thing about connecting with VCs um, is that it's a people business. It's still kind of old-fashioned that way. You know, it's, it's, it's about who knows whom. So you're not going to send some partner at Sequoia a LinkedIn invite and expect a response. Please just know that. It ain't happening, typically. Like, what's going to happen is you're going to get your target list. You're going to come to Tim or me or some other person in your tribe, and you're going to say, well, I noticed that you know this person. Do you know them really, or is it one of those fake connections on LinkedIn that no one really ever knows? Or can you help me out, right? So I just want you to know that when it comes to connections, good relationships make good business. We who have those relationships will always be very cautious, right? Because our reputation is at risk too, Right. So it's not like, oh, no, no worry, I'll do a little email intro. No, that's not, that's not how it goes down. I want to make sure I check in with the investor before I introduce you. That makes the speed, makes us all go faster. Does that make sense? You really have to know your connections. This is not a blind email game. Now, maybe one day it is. And by the way, there are, more, there are some sophisticated platforms like Fundable, uh, AngelList, et cetera. But still, at the end of the day, people invest in people, period. Okay, next, the focus on your narrative. This is your pitch, and there are jillions of blogs and videos. Good grief. Everybody and their brother has some of these out. Let me tell you this. The thing that's most important is that you are in your body, your physical and emotional body, when you are presenting your company story. You cannot be detached from it. Remember, they are not your friend. These investors are not trying to be your buddies. They do not want to play golf. They're not, they don't have time for that. They want you to make money so they can, right? And they have people that have invested in them. So if you think you're going to kind of show up and entertain them, get over it. You will fail. You're not, they don't want you to be a thought leader, they want you to describe your business in a way that helps them understand they can make money with you. Their main thing is money. It just is, right? It's not about personal relationship. They want that. Now, maybe after you make money together, you're buddies, and you fly around or go fishing or whatever, but not before. Trust me. Don't have that expectation. It just doesn't work that way. I'm almost done with these. Now, let's talk. We're doing the countdown, just like on the TV shows. Okay, on the countdown. Now, what's OMTM? Very important. If you're building any kind of business, the one 
metric that matters. That's right out of Lean Startup. If you haven't read that book, you should. It gives you the right methodology to build a business fast, check out market, product market fit, and iterate. This is so, so important. Let me give you an example. One metric that matters could be activation. Let's talk about that. Who's ever used Stack Overflow? Who's ever used Instagram? Probably Instagram's a better example here. Instagram. Okay, if you've used Instagram, what's the moment that you know value has been exchanged with you as a user of Instagram and your audience. That is when someone likes it. You want, oh, values exchanged. That's activation. That's one example of a, of a metric that matters. It may not be the one for your business, but it, one that matters. So I would get you to think about that. Last thing, it is so fascinating to me how entrepreneurs, including myself, get happy ears. You know, we, we get a little smile and it's like, you know, singing Oasis in the desert. And we'll come back, oh, the investor really liked me. He liked the deal, you know? I'm like, no, he doesn't. He's being nice. How other than his smile or his body language, what other indicator did you get that he's interested in giving you money? Well, I'm not sure. Well, because he isn't. Right? And so you need to think about that. In fact, David Cohen, when he was here, he's from Boulder. He's with Techstars. We have an, we're investor in them. They're an investor in Conexus, Rod's company. So he did a blog post. We put it up on our site, Centrifuge's site. You should check it out. It's all about the tools and skills to understand what the real attitude is of the investor. So, you know, your ears may be cute, but don't have happy ears. Okay, last thing. Summary. Here are the five things. Number one, create a target list, not a wish list. Research connections and know that LinkedIn is kind of halfway bogus. Not as a platform, but just as, you know, Brian and Wendy are supposed to know each other. Well, we met, met twice. Okay, whatever. Am I going to ask him to get to know you? Probably not. Uh, then there's focus on the narrative, the story. They're investing in a capability and a market and you, right? But you've got to stay present with that. You've got to find the one metric that matters because investors want that. And you've got to watch out for happy years. That's pretty cool. Okay, I'm wrapping it up. So there are a couple of things I would ask of you other than being so kind and listening to this presentation. First of all, I hope you are better informed as a result, especially if you're going to go out and try to get other people's money. It's a big responsibility. Number two, we would love for each and all, each and every one of you to get involved in Startup Cincy. It is a movement as well as a strategy. I am a self-appointed teacher priestess of Startup Sensei, and then I operate Centrifuge. Join the conversation on any of these channels. Other than that, thank you very much for having me. Good afternoon.